Good morning, everybody. Uh, Simon Cliss, my name. I'm a member of the church here. Uh, there are my notes. Um, oh, yeah, there we are. A new series that I've called Behold Our God. Uh, Dan, uh, a couple of times, has quoted this statement from Tim Hughes. Uh, and given that worship is the whole of our lives, uh, I wonder what you make of these words. It, 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 actually, it's difficult to see, is it? I'm sorry. It's a bit... A bit uh, um, Often our worship dries up because we fail to passionately explore the fullness of who God is. We dumb him down to an earthly level, failing to see that he is above and beyond our human understanding. When we encounter God as the uncreated, all-powerful, self-existent, unfathomable, and infinite maker of all things, we find perspective. We learn to embrace the smallness of ourselves, of who we are, and marvel at the vastness of who he is. Dan, over a series of five talks, has been exploring the character of God, that God is outside time, that he's all-powerful, that he's ever-present, that he's unchanging and unchangeable. I wonder whether, you, when you hear those words, uh, what you make of that. Is that helpful? Are there aspects of God that are missing from that description of God in Tim Hughes's statement? Are there things that are missing about ourselves as we think about, we're told about our smallness? Are there other things about us when we think about God? That's my prayer over the coming five weeks, that as we explore uh, two of the minor prophets, our vision of God will be expanded I'm hoping that you'll be able to add adjectives into the description of God from Tim Hughes and new ways of understanding ourselves in relation to God. This series comes with a government health warning. It's not going to be an easy ride. Uh, I feel like a... Um, steward on an aircraft, you need to fasten your seat belts. It's going to be turbulent. Uh, when the group of five of us who were uh, preaching in this series met together, we were noticeably anxious and apprehensive, fearful, um, uh, and actually um, I feel a little bit like a minor prophet myself, having been kind of um, living and breathing some of the words of the prophets over the last few months. So forgive me if I'm, my heart's on my sleeve a bit more than usual. I think one of the things that we, we felt, though, that, that there's something quite strange and unfamiliar about uh, these books. And you may have sensed that as Pauline was uh, reading some of those verses out. And, and so I think it's important to... to put a couple of things down in terms of understanding, accessing this material before we look at Joel. So my talk's in two parts. One, thinking about prophecy, uh, the, the prophets and who the prophets were, and then we're going to look at, start looking at Joel. I think there's a danger, you see, that because it's so strange and unfamiliar, we just, it just, it passes us by, we don't, don't notice it, we kind of just can't connect with it. I think there's a danger that we dismiss it as some kind of primitive understanding of God and the way he works. Uh, and I think also we could waste our time going down philosophical rabbit holes. Uh, the, the, as we'll see, the prophets weren't there to... Um, um, the wisdom literature was there uh, for pondering some of the really challenging questions of life. The prophets are saying some very direct, truthful, and important things. Um, and so some introductory remarks... Um, we need to remind ourselves that all scripture is, is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, and training in righteousness. Uh, when Paul wrote those words, he was referring to Joel and to Micah. 
You remember Jesus on the road to Emmaus um, said those um, when they still didn't realize who he was. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Joel, yes, Micah, yes, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Micah and Joel, part of God's word to us today. And two um, re really important concepts here that will unlock our understanding. First, um, the prophets as literature, and second, the prophets as people. Uh, many of you will have been doing the Bible course, and you'll know that the, the Bible is a library of 66 books, many different authors, and very importantly, with different kinds of literature. The um, prophets is a distinct kind of literature. In fact, if you, if you added up all the words of the prophets, the 16 books, the, the three major prophets, and the 14, uh, revising what I said on the video, um, minor prophets, uh, it adds up to the number of words in the whole New Testament. It's a big chunk of our scriptures. Uh, but it's different literature to other aspects. It's different to wisdom literature, it's different to the gospels, to um, the letters. And actually, it's a kind of poetry, but a, a poetry not as we know it. It's apocalyptic poetry. Uh, don't think I wandered lonely as a cloud among the daffodils. It's not that kind of poetry. Uh, it's strident, it's jarring. How about for that for a quote? The prophet's word is a scream in the night while the world is at ease, and I must change my glasses and asleep, the prophet feels like the blast from heaven. That's the literature of the prophets. Um, also good to know, it's, it's not like a, a kind of uh, linear. It's like, a, like an anthology of poems. Uh, there's some repetition. Uh, like a symphony, there are movements, and you see patterns repeating, and we'll see that in Joel. Um, and the last thing, yeah, we tend to think of prophets as foretelling, and it's about predicting the future. There's an awful lot of forth-telling, and how about this? Uh, it's not so much uh, seeking to convey a mere passive opinion from God as if God were anxious to ensure that mankind knew what was on his heart before they made up their own minds, but uh, rather the proclamation of God's word uh, so that the whole situation changes uh, radically. Uh, that's the prophetic literature. What about um, the prophets as people? Yeah. Uh, another, the, the African Bible commentary said, the prophets were God's mouthpiece to a generation. Uh, and there's some intensity, and this is what I've been feeling reading the prophets over the last few months, uh, there's an intensity. They're, they're, they're intensely immersed in the things of God. Uh, they're also intensely immersed in the prophetic tradition. There were, there were a whole school of prophets of which Joel and Micah were, were two of over a, a number of centuries. Uh, so much so um, that, um, that the third point, that they, they, they didn't mind, uh, they weren't courting public opinion. They didn't mind being unpopular. And actually they were kind of from the margins, uh, they had a sort of wild, they were creatives, they were, were they neurodiverse, a number of them? We, they didn't have those categories in those days. But they were the kind of people, I don't know whether you have friends like this, they're kind of awkward, but actually you appreciate things that they say sometimes. Um, we can have friends that always sort of tell us nice things, but what you really want is a friend that sometimes, it's just a bit jarring, but says something that you really need to hear. So that's the kind of, that's the kind of prophets. Um, and lastly, um, the Bible Project talked about them being covenant watchdogs, um, spiritual whistleblowers. Think of God um, and his covenant people. The, the kind of atmosphere here is of a, of a disharmony in a marriage. You know, that's, you know the, the, the emotions are running high because this is, 
This is important stuff as far as God's concerned. So this is the, the kind of, the, the kind of the, the passion that comes through the, the minor prophets. Yeah, I love this quote. Uh, and I really want to be able to read that. Um, no, you can't hear me. The prophet is human, yet employs notes one octave too high for human ears. Uh, he's neither a singing saint nor a moralizing poet, but an assaulter of the mind. Often his words begin to burn where conscience ends. How about that? So that's the prophet. So uh, grow to love the prophets. In, uh, open the book of Isaiah. Uh, enjoy Joel and Micah because it's the word of God spoken in this very kind of un untainted, sort of unfiltered way. Uh, breathe. That's the end of the first part of the talk. Um, I mean, just one last thing. Just because it's poetry doesn't mean it's full of truth. Um, poetry can pack a punch, can't it? Uh, so, but it, it, it's understanding uh, and sitting humbly under... Uh, the, this poetry, this, this apocalyptic poetry for today. Um, we're looking at the book of Joel in two parts. Uh, this is part one. Uh, Paul um, will be taking us through part two. And just to warn you, I'm going to leave you on a cliffhanger. Um, I'm taking you to halfway through, and we will sit uncomfortably by the end of part one. And I think it's good to sit uncomfortably for a while. Um, don't, don't, don't rush on to the end. Sit with the discomfort. Uh, the other thing, if, you, if, you, if you've got Bibles open, um, it's worth seeing that um, something of this anthology of poetry idea. Because the bit that we're going to look at, um, which is like the first half, chapter 1 is like one poem, and then chapter 2, verses 1 to 17, is another poem. And, and both of these poems have a sort of, a, a kind of description, a vivid description of events, and then a kind of response. Uh, and that happens again in chapter 2. So when you come to it later, you'll, you'll see that. Something about Joel. Um, Joel means, significantly, Yahweh is God. That's significant. Uh, he was probably a temporal prophet, living in Jerusalem, around 500 BC, so it's kind of late. It's after the, the people were returned from exile, Judean settlers. They, it was a far cry from the glory days of King Solomon and King David. Um, it, life was a struggle. There were no kings. That's why at the beginning of, of Joel, there's no mention of a king. Most prophets have sort of in the days of, but there's no king now. Uh, and as we read, it's the time of national disaster. I wonder whether you've been in a situation where things have been going badly and then yet another thing happens. And you kind of think, really? Really? Well, this is the context in which God's mouthpiece for a generation speaks. So, <laughs> listen in. There's a plague of locusts, a devastating plague of locusts that wipes out the harvest for the whole land and... Uh, Joel describes it ex in an extraordinary way. Hear this, you elders. Listen, all you who live in the land. Has anything like this happened in your days or in the days of your ancestors? Tell it to your children um, and let your children tell it to their children and the children of the next generation. And when I was first reading that, I thought it was a rhetorical question. Um, has anything happened? In other words, well, no, it hasn't. But actually, the answer is yes, it has happened. Not in their day. Uh, do you remember uh, uh, at the time of, of the people of Israel in Egypt, in captivity in Egypt? Uh, there were ten plagues in Egypt, and the eighth plague was the plague of locusts. And at that point, God's judgment was coming on Pharaoh and the empire of Egypt for its tyranny and enslavement and its refusal to repent. Note that because uh, things have turned in terms of this uh, these events, the plague of locusts here is not against the uh, surrounding nations, but it's uh, to the people of Israel that God's covenant people. 
significantly. And so Joel says, elders, listen. Um, actually, tell it to your children is interesting. It, do you remember the Passover instructions? There was a lot of that about tell it to your children and to their children and their children. Joel is using the same language to say, you know, take note of what's happening here. Um, God's judgment in this form. Uh, I want you to remember this. This is significant. Um, so first of all, to the elders, and then um, he, he then... Um, talks to the drunkards. I don't think he's singling out those that get drunk. It's more that the drunkards haven't got any drink because of the harvest failing. Um, uh, then he, he talks uh, to the priests, says, says, mourn priests, to the farmers and the vine growers, despair. Uh, and he, there comes a call to lamentation. Put on sackcloth, you priests, and mourn. This is verse 13. Wail, you who minister before the Lord. Um, num- uh, uh, verse 14. Declare a holy fast. Like, call it a, a, a national um, uh, event of, of, of lamentation. Uh, and why? So we can cry out to the Lord. The Lord our God, a God that they knew And then verse 15, that uh, is a challenging word, isn't it? Alas for that day, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come like destruction from the Almighty. And the same idea is is followed up uh, at the beginning of the second poem. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm on my holy hill. Let all who live in the land tremble. For the day of the Lord is coming. It's close at hand. And then if you hadn't really got the message by now, comes the gut-wrenching punch of verse 11. The, the, when the second poem happens, you start to think, is he talking about locusts or is he talking about army soldiers? And then as the poetry becomes more and more um, expansive, you then actually think, no, it's actually cosmic here. There's... Um, The sun and the moon are darkened and the stars no longer shine. And then he says, the Lord thunders at the head of his army. His forces are beyond number and mighty is the army that obeys his command. The day of the Lord is great. It is dreadful. Who can endure it? This is not a picture of a God sitting on the sidelines of human history impotently watching events unfold and seeing if he gets permission to put some first aid uh, bandages on the wounded. This is a God who's right in the thick of human history. And I don't know whether those of you who love the Messiah will recognize those words, who can endure it? Malachi, you remember, talks about the same day of the Lord. Who can endure it? We turn to this final uh, section, which is a call to repentance. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord. Uh, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. This is our climax. This is the cliffhanger. Even now, God's saying, it's not too late. Rend and return. Uh, We're going to sing a rend collective song. Their, Their name was based on this verse. Rend your hearts not your garment, not a superficial thing. Uh, It's the idea of change your whole attitude. Uh, The same idea as um, in the psalm when it says, a broken and contrite heart you will not despise. And return to God, not any God, but your God, the God that you know, who's then described so beautifully. And what Joel picks up on is the most quoted verses in the whole Old Testament by other Old Testament authors, and that's uh, from Exodus 34. And I would really encourage you to look at the Bible Project 
material on, on this. There's a whole series of videos, but also podcasts behind it. Because this is how God described himself. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving forgiveness, forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished, he punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents of the third and fourth generation. One small thing. Um, love for thousands, thousands of generations actually, is the first part of that. Um, punish the guilty to the third and fourth generation. Uh, God is saying something there in terms of his um, compassion and his grace and his mercy. But though that was the God that Joel and the people of, of the time knew. And it, he's the same God for us. And so uh, here, I think, is, is where we start to add adjectives to the God that Tim Hughes described. And as I was trying to say on the video, we start to feel God's pulse uh, and, and we feel his heart. Um, some of the... the that the philosophers, theologians talk about the pathos of God, that God is a, a, a God who wears heart on his sleeve. He's not some cool, dispassionate deity, but he's a God that's fully in. He's invested in the world that he's made and in us, his people. Uh, I want us to sit uncomfortably with that as our cliffhanger. And just for the final few minutes, and I hope you would just allow me a, another few minutes just to draw out some thoughts for ourselves now. And um, I, I think I was trying to allude to this earlier, but um, when we look at the prophets, um, they're part of the whole of the scriptures. Uh, the Bible Project talks about all the books being like a mosaic. When you get the whole lot together, you get a very full and comprehensive picture. Um, but this, this, makes, this was in a question and answer about why suffering, as Dan was looking at last week. And um, what this is, 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 is trying to um, explain is that um, what, what we see when we, when we look at the scriptures is not some sort of systematic sort of um, answer to all our questions, but what we, what we find is the character of God that we can trust and, and, and believe in. And, and, uh, and it's within that context that we wrestle with really very difficult questions. Um, that's the cliffhanger. Uh, and I think sometimes at the top of the cliff, maybe we can see things with a bit more clarity than sometimes at other times. So, so sit with the discomfort of the cliffhanger. And I was just trying to bring it um, closer to home and thinking of current world, national, church, St. James's by the Park events. Uh, uh, we should be asking the question, what is God saying? Uh, to us today in our world with the US elections, with this, the floods in Spain, um, with what's going on in Gaza. I'm not saying that there are kind of, okay, um, you know, this is the answer, this is what God is saying, but God is intimately involved in each of those situations. Uh, the budget this week, um, Alistair Campbell's interview with the Archbishop of Canterbury, um, St. James by the Park, God is, is speaking. Uh, he is intimately involved in history. And from Joel, we can see that God is sovereign. We can see that God is judge. And God's judgment is to be reckoned with. Alec Mottier helpfully said, though, that judgment is not to condemn or to pass a sentence, an adverse sentence but it is to make whatever decision settles a matter. And of all issues, to put things to right. The fact that God's judge is the best news in the world. Uh, it's, it's the best news ever because we know the character of God. And God is passionate. We will be saying at Christmas time, the zeal of the Lord uh, will accomplish this. That's, that's, this is... God's heart. This is, this is his passion, his, his intimate involvement with all that's happening in the world. Uh, 
when we meet a God like that, we, we, we rend and we repent, we return. Joel never really mentions the specific sins that the people are being called to repent of. But again and again, it's idolatry, it's injustice, it's false alliances, it's serial unfaithfulness. Do any of those things connect with us in our thinking? Globally, surely, individual level? Do we need to rend and return? And the day of the Lord is near, it's coming, it's close at hand, it's great and it's dreadful. Paul will help us to understand that more next week. Um, I've been reading a, the autobiography of Martin Luther King recently and um, he was so compelled by the sense of urgency that, that um, I think Dan mentioned it recently, but as a young man with most of my life ahead of me, I decided early to give my life to something eternal and absolute, not to these little gods that are here today and gone tomorrow, but to God, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So as we, as we think about the day of the Lord, it changes our perspective on our lives now. Tim Keller, I don't know whether you heard him interviewed as he was facing his last days with his stage four cancer. But he said, life is now crystal clear now. Um, he had clarity because he was preparing to meet his maker. Everything was different. In fact, Tim Keller didn't get busier when he realized he was making his make, making him. Actually, he got less busy because actually he saw things in perspective. But it, it really changed things. How about that for us? How about living each day because it might be the day we meet our maker? Uh, I, I want us to be quiet for a, a moment. And, and then I'm going to invite you to adopt a posture that you, want, that you feel is appropriate to respond to the God that we've been meeting this morning. So that might be to stand. You might want to stand and just put your hands out saying, yes, this is me. You might want to um, sit and bow your head. You might want to kneel down if, if you're able to do that. So give us just a, a few minutes to just to be quiet in the presence of Yahweh, the Lord our God. Um, and, and Joe, if you could put the words of the prayer of preparation just, uh, just up there, and uh, I'll come to that in a minute. So if you want to stand, do. If you want to kneel, do. If you want just to uh, bow your head. Because each of us needs to recognize that the Lord is God. He's the maker of all things. He's the judge of all. And the day of the Lord is dreadful is to be reckoned with. These words we say as we prepare for communion, but it's appropriate for us now. So shall we say together, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, 
that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.